Okay, so now let's formulate the problem that we are solving in a specific sense. So I say that that's my world, that's a place where all the agents would operate. And I've got a number of robotic agents like this. So these are the different robots that are in the arena. Say there are some obstacles around like this. And let's take in a specific robot, this one. And this robot needs to go all the way here, which is its goal. And of course, I can make nice complex searches that deliberately find out whether the robot goes like this or like this or like this. When it's going here, this person might come. So it might wait here and then go whatever. I could do complex searches for that. However, my aim is to make a reactive system which can get this simulation done. So in a reactor system, what happens that every agent, a robot over here, looks at the surrounding entities and based on the surrounding entities, it makes a decision what should it do. So we model it like that for the robot R, the linear speed and the angular speed. So every robot will move by a linear speed and an angular speed. So that's the linear speed and that's the angular speed. We say in a reactive system, the linear and the angular speed is a function of now, there are two things that I need to simultaneously do. I need to avoid all these obstacles. So it's a function of, say, a few nearest obstacles. There are other agents. So we generalize this thing to a few nearest obstacles, which could also be moving agents, robots, people. Now, if they are moving for reasons that I'll speak right at the end, I say along with their speeds. So classic example, I'm here, there's an agent here. How do I act? It depends upon its speed. If this agent is moving here, I can just follow. On the contrary, if this agent is moving here, I'll have to very quickly do this or this. If this agent on the other hand was stationary, then I would have gone it like this. So I say that the speeds of the agents also do matter in the kind of decision that I make. This is the one that will enable me avoid obstacles. Then I also need to go towards the goal. So I need an angle to goal so that I can turn myself in the angle to goal. And sometimes I need a distance to goal so that I can stop at the goal rather than going towards. So if Distance to goal is not an input. What will happen is I am here. This is my goal. I need to stop here. So I should start decelerating here. My speed should be very small here. My speed should be nearly zero here. And here I need to stop. So distance to goal. So when we say reactive decision making, when we say Reactive behaviors, when we say reactively moving, we just say that I make it a simple mathematical expression where my control input, my linear and angular speed is just a function of who all is nearby, what is my distance to them, what is my... angle to them, 
So its distance and angle to a few nearest obstacle moving entities. Their speeds are also important along with their speeds. So the direction of the speed is also important. So let me change it to velocity. This is what gives me the obstacle avoidance behavior rules. So this is for obstacle avoidance. And this is for goal seeking. So distance to canyonist obstacles, angle to canyonist obstacles, speed of canyonist obstacles, orientation of canyonist obstacles, angle to goal and distance to goal. Any function which does that is what I will use for my immediate navigation. Now we look at the most interesting of these algorithms as the first algorithm and the first reactive algorithm, we'll construct a few reactive algorithms over the next few classes for simulating entities and the first algorithm that I will consider will be called as the artificial potential field. So, the algorithm is pretty intuitive and interesting. All that I'm gonna ask you to do is that you imagine that the goal which is shown by this cross over here is nothing but a charged particle. So I keep a virtual charged particle with a positive charge and I embed it at the goal itself. Now what I do is all around the obstacles I place in negative charges like this. So it's not a dashed line, it's me taking, going to the supermarket and buying some negative charges. You don't get them at Amazon by the way. And I emit them all over the boundary like this over here. And what I also do is, along with these negative charges, I take my robot, which is the one which is acting, and I take it to be a highly negative charged particle. Now, what happens is that in electrostatics, the positive and negative, they love each other. So I bought some charged, positive charged particle, I place it at the goal, I bought some negative charged particle, I place it at the robot, and now it will be a beautiful love story where the goal and robot will attract each other, they will come walking towards each other like a nice Hindi film movie, except for the goal is fixed, it cannot move. So it's not the Romeo and Juliet coming towards each other, it's just a robot arm, which is the Romeo, which is running towards the Juliet, which is the goal, because one of them is positive charged, the other one is negative charged, and opposites attract. Now, as it tries to go towards the positive charged goal, what will happen is the negative and negative charges, they repel each other. So as it goes around over here, what's gonna happen is that this robot is gonna feel a negative charge because of these and will start repelling. So simultaneously two forces are acting, one which is pushing the robot towards the goal, the other one which is avoiding the robot from colliding with obstacles and other people because of this negative charge just repelling each other. So it was a Romeo running towards the Juliet and now suddenly you've got a uh, entry of a villain which will not let the hero and heroine meet and will push the hero back, will push the robot back. 
The robot will simultaneously be repelled by the obstacle and attracted by the goal and as a result it eventually reaches towards the goal. Now this diagram has got a little bit cluttered so let me draw the same diagram again this time only showing the static obstacles for clarity the dynamic ones will behave similarly. So that's my negative charge. And this is my goal, which is positively charged. So attraction, 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 attraction. And suddenly this villain comes. Let's draw another obstacle. So repulsion, 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 attraction, repulsion, attraction, repulsion, repulsion, repulsion. Now it starts getting to repel from here. So attraction, a little bit of a repulsion, attraction, attraction, attraction. And there you go the love story completed so at any point of time around over here uh, let me take in a random time let's say here oops let's say here and let me draw a free body diagram of this little thing so here it feels attraction towards this goal so there is a f attraction towards goal this feels repulsion from this obstacle so the repulsion is what is opposite in nature and because of this the repulsion will go around from this obstacle so let's say obstacle 1 and obstacle 2 because of obstacle 1 the repulsion will go around over here and because of obstacle 2 the repulsion will go around over here and the robot will act because of the summation of these two forces. So let me clarify it over here. So I say F repulsion 1, the repulsion due to obstacle 1. Remember it's opposite in direction and this is F repulsion 2. So add up all the forces. So this plus this, it's a little force over here. And then this little force over here plus this is this resultant force F total. And then you know what to do. So it's a virtual world. You apply this virtual force. And the robot moves as a result of this virtual force all the way up to where it points to. And you do that every point of time. You have reached the goal. Congratulations. The love story and the movie is over.